Good evening, everyone. My name is Steph Manette, and on behalf of the Bookshelf and Anik Press, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to what promises to be a very interesting, uh, fun, and in educational evening with uh, Les Stroud. He's here tonight promoting his book, uh, Wild Outside, which is his uh, first children's book, and he'll be in conversation with Al uh, Adam Schultz, who I'm just going to introduce to you. Uh, just to let you know how this format of the evening will work, for those of you who have never joined a, a webinar before, uh, we will be doing a brief introduction, uh, both authors, and uh, Les will be talking about his book predating the uh, the event of actual having the conversation uh, Q&A with Adam, and then Adam will do a little bit of a formal conversation with him. Uh, following that, we will be allowing for uh, audience questions, which will be submitted via the chat screen. So if you would like to ask Les anything in particular while you're listening to the conversation, please do so. Uh, and we will get to those questions at the end of the, uh, the formal Q&A. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Adam Schultz. Uh, he is one of Canada's top wilderness authors and has three natural best-selling uh, books to his name, uh, the last of which, uh, Beyond the Trees, tells a tale of his nearly 4,000-kilometer solo journey across Canada's Arctic. Uh, CBC has called him one of Canada's greatest living explorers, and we're excited to have him uh, here to interview Les this evening. And now to introduce the uh, man of the hour, Les Stroud, uh, who is a whose work as a filmmaker, author, and musician has celebrated, uh, been celebrated around the globe. Uh, he's credited with creating the survival TV genre and remains a prolific artist uh, focused on celebrating nature. Please join me in welcoming Les Stroud. And I'm here. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, and so Steph, I think, is, is this, this is me then? I can take it from here, is that correct? You can give me the thumbs up if I am correct in that. I don't see Adam anywhere. Adam, hopefully you are showing up very soon as well. Uh, yes, Steph, I can go ahead. Well, I'm gonna go ahead anyway, looks like. Okay, there, I got it. One of those big, big yellow thumbs up. So yes, everybody, my, I am Lester Adam. Actually, um, funnily enough, it should be the other way. I should actually be interviewing Adam, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I know his work very well, and uh, it's actually just an honor. Adam, I know we're going to talk in just a bit, and it, it really is my honor, as I said earlier, uh, to, to meet you and be able to have this conversation. Uh, wow, where do I begin? I should begin with the book, of course. Uh, I am, again, also super honored, and I will just say even privileged privilege to have been able to connect with Anik Press out of Toronto with this, my new book, my first children's book. Uh, and I think one of the first questions I get a lot of the times is, you know, why, why now? Why do a children's book sort of thing? Well, the funny reality is that some of you may be familiar with my work uh, as a documentary filmmaker. And that started well over 30 years, well, actually 30 years ago, but uh, proper 20 years ago when it comes to the Survivor Man um, and, uh, documentary series and everything that, that is associated with that. Well, for years, uh, it was still enjoyed by young adults, by kids, uh, evidenced by the fact that I would actually get photographs of kids dressing up as me for Halloween. And I thought, well, if you don't, you, you can't get a better endorsement than that. And the reality is that they always loved Survivor Man and Shark Week and other shows that I worked on. And I knew that, and, but those shows are specifically uh, produced for an adult uh, audience, if you will. However, knowing that the kids loved it so much. When I finally contacted Anik Press, I'll be honest with you, I actually contacted them because I have um, a, a kid's book in my brain still that has yet to come out, but it was largely fictional. Uh, it revolved around the wilderness, of course. It revolved around adventures, absolutely, but it was much more fictional in its approach. And uh, the wonderful people at Anik, you know, they looked, I guess they took a look, to, took a look at the obvious and said, well, you're known for this, you do this, what, can, we, can we start with a more of a nonfiction style book? And from there, uh, you know, my challenge was to get my, my, uh, my voice right in voicing it for younger age, but in the end, that wasn't really that difficult at all. I've been teaching kids forever. When I was a wilderness guide for 15 years before filming my survival exploits and my adventuring exploits, uh, I was guiding kids. You know, and anybody who's ever guided out there knows the deal. You know, in the summer, you're taking out wealthy people from New York on a canoe trip to uh, in the Nahani River. Uh, but when you get to those shoulder seasons, schools, 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 and schools. And so thousands of kids I was able to guide out there. So I knew my, my voice in speaking to them. And so this book finally gave me the chance to talk about my adventures, to 
teach as well, uh, to give ideas for how to be out there in adventure, uh, but with a voice just directed to the kids. It was my chance just to say, okay, guys, this, this is just me and you. Nobody's here. No, no adults around. This is just you and I talking right now. So what, what we did was I, we started with me simply telling the adventures. And that was easy. I've got 100 more I can't wait to tell. But we, we sort of picked, I think, arbitrarily 12, maybe 10, 10 or 12 adventures of mine. And okay, that's fine. The adventure is fine. It's cool and it's fun. I'm going to talk about getting chased by a jaguar in the Amazon jungle. I'm going to talk about um, becoming hypothermic in Norway, sliding on a mountainside, uh, bumping into a lynx in uh, Ontario. But what are the lessons I learned in those? And that's where uh, wonderful, wonderful, I will adore her for the rest of my life, Claire Caldwell at Anic Press. Uh, she's so smart and, and she knew how to capture my voice for me this way. And uh, I will give kudos where it's deserved. It was, it was Claire who came up with the four sort of bracketed concepts for the book, which is, well, you know, from reading your stories less, it looks like you're teaching how to prepare for adventure, how to observe what's going on around you, especially when things go wrong or right, how to properly react in a situation like that, and then how to adapt moving forward. And that's what we did. We looked at my stories and kind of put them in those four categories. So most of the stories have multiple lessons, but some lessons are stronger than others. And uh, so we put them in there. Then, so now we've got our adventures, which are kind of rapid faced, rapid paced. We've got the lessons learned from them and very candid lessons in many situations. And then, well, let me give them some, some uh, uh, of their own keys, their own license to go out. And so I think it was my idea in this case to say, can I, can I insert things they can do on their own when they get out there? Now that leads me to get out where? Do you have to be um, like Les Stroud and go to the top of the Andes in Peru or a jungle? Do you have to be like Adam Schultz and go across the Arctic on your own? No. The adventure, the underpinning context of this whole book on the grass. And as I grew up as a kid in, uh, on the West, I, 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 I know this is, this, this is all, a lot of this is about Guelph. And by the way, uh, um, the connection there, my daughter went to the university in Guelph. So I've been there many, many, many times. Uh, but I grew up in the West End of Toronto. It's not really nature there, not really, certainly not when I was there, which was a long time ago. I found my nature in, an, in, a, in a, how can I put this, in a neighborhood that didn't care about nature, with friends who didn't really care about nature, with a family who did have, didn't have any connection to nature. So where do I find my nature if it feels like it's burning inside me? I wanna, well, two places. First of all, in that era, one was television. Uh, Jacques Cousteau specials. This is an underwater explorer. And the other one was Tarzan movies. And if you think about it, Tarzan is like, or, or sorry, Survivor Man was my hybrid between Jacques Cousteau and, Tar and Tarzan, putting them both together. That's kind of how that came about. And the second place was just out on the grass on the lawn. And I, I, I'm definitely like what we would say a closet entomologist. I loved ants. I had ant farms. So even though I was a kid, you know, wanting to be a big time adventurer, I, I also, by the way, let me go this direction. I thought though that being a full on adventurer was out of my reach. Only rich people become big photographers for National Geographic. And only people with money and connections could, I was wrong, very wrong. Now I pacified myself, if you will, by watching those ants and the butterflies and, and um, going to the field and behind the Dominion grocery store to see praying mantises. Uh, it wasn't until later that I learned that, no, there's so much adventure all around every kid that's out there. Every young adult has access to adventure, even if you live in a condo or downtown uh, in an apartment or you have a backyard. And right now I'm in uh, a hotel uh, just outside Canmore uh, in the Rocky Mountains because I'm here filming a show called Wild Harvest. And it's all about foraging local ingredients and then I bring him into uh, Chef Paul Rogalski from Calgary, who turns him into an amazing meal. But the show we just shot just yesterday was right in the middle of the city of Calgary, finding local foraging ingredients in a, in a waste parking lot sort of area. So again, even what I'm doing now, it's always been about empowering kids to get out in nature and enabling them, letting them know it's okay 
to have an ant farm. It's okay to be obsessed with butterflies or lions or orca whales. And that's, I think, what a lot of what I've done for a lot of years, including Survivor Man. You know, without Survivor Man, you don't get those other shows, all those big shows you may know of. Uh, but none of them could actually really do it. And that was a big difference, was I insisted that I had to do this stuff for real. But the point of Survivor Man was always to say, you guys can do this too. And say, oh, I could do what you could do. And I would say, yeah, you can. That's my point. You don't have to be a survival guru. Of course, I was good at what I did. And of course, I knew some tricks and things. But most of the time, I'll tell you what, when I had something that I could do in a certain location, like a desert, and I knew there was a particular way of starting a fire. Well, instead of training on that method before I went out there to film an episode of Survivor Man, I wouldn't train because I thought, no, this is just something I read in a book. Oh, I could do start a fire this way. So I'll try it for the very first time while my, my camera is rolling so that if I get it or I don't get it, you see it real time. And if I don't get it, you can tell, oh, this one hurt. He's, he's failed. You see my failures. If I do get it, then my enthusiasm and my euphoria is very palpable. Again, the whole point was just saying, oh, I'm just a regular dude. I'm a regular dude from the rest, West End of Toronto who's just really passionate about nature. So being able to, to, to write wild outside and share this passion with, with the kids. And Adam, I hope you're there because I'm going to be turning this over to you in just a second. Because as I said, I love doing Q&As, by the way. There he is. See, again, I should be interviewing you, not the other way around. But that's okay. We'll do it. We'll do it next time. Uh, I, I have to say this whole book is just about empowering and enabling kids to, to feel like it's okay to be a wilderness geek. Uh, when I started the survival thing, I used to say, yeah, you know, uh, most of my buddies in survival are pretty geeky. Mm -hmm. Yep, pretty geeky. And I would say, but not me. I wasn't one of the geeks. No way. And I, 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 and I would say, like, I just... I'm going to make survival sexy. You'll see one day. And I'll leave you with this one story, by the way, when it comes to knowing that we can get out there and kids can get out there and explore, um, was that when I first pitched Survivor Man, I want you to hear this. This is a side tangent story, but it's kind of, kind of sort of relates because it's about really going after and achieving what you want to in life. I took it to network executives. And you know what they said to me? And this is quote, end quote. Okay, so verbatim. And I'll, I'll say it like the, in one case, the, uh, the, the director for Discovery Canada said to me, less, just like that, condescending. And she said, ready? No one is ever going to want to watch people survive on television. And I said, no, no, you just don't get it. You're wrong. This can be good. And I walked down the hall and I met a much different lady named Anna Stambolic who said, you're kidding. She passed on this? I think you got something here. Let's try it. And the rest is history. So here I am now with Anik Press and my new children's book, Wild Outside, kids book. Uh, by the way, finding out that ages seven all the way through to 16 uh, and older. Are, in fact, I have adults saying, well, I'm not a kid, but I love it. So uh, here I am. And Adam, I'm going to turn this over to you now so we can have some fun with the Q&A. Nice to meet you uh, virtually. Adam and I are meeting for the first time, by the way, right here and now. So anyway, nice to meet you, Adam. Yes, nice to meet you too, uh, Les, and uh, it's great to be here with you, and we're going to get to the questions in just a second. I saw we already had some audience ones coming in, but I've got a few of my own uh, to kick things off right now. I've been a huge fan of yours uh, for a long time, ever since I was a teenager, and I mm -hmm. saw the first episode of Survivor Man, and I thought it was the most brilliant thing in the history of television. It was so real and authentic, the way you filmed it all yourself, and you took us on a metaphorical journey all over the world to all these amazing locations. And my first question has to do with that because your book is uh, similar in that it takes the reader on a journey to an incredibly diverse range of different environments, all of which you've experienced firsthand and survived in. Uh, we get everywhere from you know lush rainforests in the Amazon to snowy mountains, to desolate tundra, uh, to the plains of Africa. I mean, you've experienced such a range of different ecosystems. So one thing I've always been curious about, as well as my friends who are big fans of your show, uh, we, we love to, to rank things and list things. So uh, what I always wonder, you know, what would you say out of the, the, all the different environments you've survived in, what would you say is maybe the hardest one you've ever faced? Like some people oh. go immediately to the deserts. Like, well, do you have a top three? Because I know you've experienced so many dozens. So maybe a top three, because I know just one is hard. But what are the three hardest environments on earth mm you've ever put yourself in. Right. Well, I think 
and I've never been asked a question for the top three. And by the way, everybody, I recognize we're all on Zoom here right now, and I may get cut out once in a while. And if I do cut out, um, uh, Adam, you can just repeat the question for me or something like that, or you can get me to repeat my answer. Uh, the, the bane of technology, but here we are. At least because of technology, we're able to do this. Uh, so the top three, and that's a different way for me to answer the question. Usually it's just, what's the hardest place to survive? So I'll go, I'll go there first. The real answer to that question of the quote unquote, the hardest place to survive, it's not about geography. I don't care where you put me. You could put me on a nice, beautiful, flat, forested train, uh, side of a mountain, uh, wherever you want to put me, I'm fine. So long as it's not cold. It's all about temperature. If it is 20 degrees Celsius, you got forgiveness time. 15, even 10, even, you got forgiveness time. The minute you dip into freezing temperatures below zero, survival becomes a game of keeping moving. You have to keep moving. You can't stop. You have to be really careful about it. Uh, you feel fine at 4 p.m. when you're busy, but 3 a.m. is another story. But if you're, you know, in a place that it may be really rugged, maybe there's no food, maybe little water, but the temperatures are sort of decent, it just, you just stop working so hard and it buys you some forgiveness time. So the, the answer of where is the hardest place, it's wherever it's below freezing. You, all, you, you know, I, oftentimes when I would shoot Survivor Man, those were the shows I dreaded. It's like, oh, I guess I should do another winter one. Oh no, this is just gonna hurt. So that was, you know, but for my top three, personally speaking, I would suggest that uh, number three, counting them down, number three was the show that I did uh, floating in a life raft. That was rough. That was really rough to, to, because you couldn't move really. I mean, you could shift positions in the raft and just slosh the water around and get, you know, you started getting salt water boils and things like that. It was, that was horrible. Um, and also a little unnerving, uh, both with the storm that came in, but also then with the doldrums that hit and just sitting there, not even moving. You're on an ocean and you're not even drifting. It was just weird. Number two, uh, super hot deserts. They're absolutely beautiful. The Kalahari, Kalahari was insanely hot. And I almost got heat stroke there. So it is dangerous. I'm not suggesting the heat isn't dangerous um, compared to the cold. But uh, the reason though for deserts in me, and it's up there on the list of more difficult is because of the, um, I guess I want to say the itch factor. You never feel like your skin breathes. Everything's dry and tight and sand and everything or dust in everything. I just find that kind of coming from a humid environment like Southern Ontario, which generally can be very humid, uh, you know, the dry dryness, although deserts are stunningly beautiful. Um, I still love them, but for survival. And then number three, uh, number one, as I already answered, definitely is just going to be uh, anywhere if it's cold. Wow, that's uh, I don't I don't think a lot of Canadians would have guessed that, knowing that you're Canadian, that you would have said the cold was the hardest. I think a lot of us Canadians, uh, we would have thought that maybe it was some of the the jungles you've been in, where everyone worries about tropical diseases and parasites and spiders no, and snakes. Well, you know, but, you know what, Adam? I mean, you know, the thing is, as I remember, I mentioned earlier that I grew up watching Tarzan. I couldn't wait to get into a jungle, and when I got there. I felt at home. I haven't been in a while. I miss those big, fat, green leaves dripping. Uh, I miss wearing nothing but a small pair of shorts for most of the time. And, and, you know, it's raining and you can stand out in it and it's warm rain. And you get to know, yeah, this, yeah you got to be careful where you sit in the Amazon, as you know. But uh, um, no, I love the jungle. Yeah, I think those are some of my favorite episodes. Whenever you're in a, a tropical rainforest, there's something about the jungle that's just so full of mystery it's fascinating i remember every time you're going to the jungle i get excited like oh there's an amazon episode coming up we got to see this one uh but yeah no doubt that i remember that that episode you had where you were in the life wrap on the ocean that one has got to be dangerous uh just you know being out there there's anything that can go wrong uh, i remember a storm was coming in while you were filming if i remember correctly i mean that's a that's a pretty extreme one as well uh as well as the african the african scenario i remember how hot that was that episode as well that looked brutal um okay so what about the other end of the scale so we all go to the, the hardest most extreme but in your experience of going to all these different environments are there ones that were actually i don't want to say easy because everything is, is it was relative you know when you have such limited gear uh but there is there an environment that you would say is maybe a little easier or at least more enjoyable 
uh, to film in and survive it? Sure. Uh, and again, I would say, so I'll, I'll answer it sort of the, the easiest right out of the starting gate. Uh, you wanna know where the easiest place to survive is? On Gilligan's Island. That's the easiest place. Now for the, that reference, for anybody where that, they have no idea who I, what I just referenced. It was a very cheesy uh, late 60s, early 70s sitcom about people lost on a tropical island. And it was really ridiculous. But my point being that uh, for me, tropical island, so long as there's a fresh source of water, you're on a vacation. You know, you're living on coconuts, you're getting uh, it's, uh, crabs and fish. Uh, it's, it's just, so a tropical island for me uh, is super easy. If you remember my episode on the Cook Islands, if anybody ever gets to see that episode, by the way, um, I'll do it just because this is all part of this, so it's sort of a shameless pl self plug, but everything Adam that I've ever done of Survivor Man, all of my, my shows, everything is up on YouTube right now on my YouTube channel. I've switched everything over um, in the business side of things, guys, I've owned everything I've ever done. No one's ever told me what to do. And so I've, I've just now put everything I've, uh, I've ever done up on my um, YouTube channels, channel Survivor Man dash Les Stroud. So if you go there and watch the Cook Islands episode, for example, um, if it looked like I was having a decent, easy time of it, it's because I was because it's just kind of easy there. So long as you've got fresh running, running water. Um, ironically, I didn't actually on that episode, but they were still really good sources of fresh water. And then uh, after that, uh, it really becomes the, the opposite to what I said about the tough places. Any place where you can be where the temperatures are fairly temperate, nice warm days, maybe cool evenings, that just makes things so much easier. Now, as a Canadian, I will say though that I'm certainly the most at home in Canada and uh, everything. And, and that comes down to something called familiarity. Uh, I think the more familiar we are with any particular ecosystem, the more we relax. And certainly I'm very familiar with Canada. So every time, in fact, if I, if I needed to say quickly film an episode, uh, for whatever reason, uh, timing of delivery for the networks or something silly like that, I would just do one in Canada because I knew I didn't have to think about it. I could just go to the Rocky Mountains or I could go to the uh, Northern Quebec and I shoot an episode and I, knew, and I knew what I was doing. So for me, for everybody, it's familiarity. Now, um, you bring someone from the Amazon jungle and say, come on up and survive in Canada. They may be incredible survivors down in, in, in Ecuador and they're going to perish in Canada. It's not, they're not familiar to it. You know, and I, I, that's what a side weird tangent is. I remember people say, oh, these people are the best survival people in the world. And I don't care if you're talking about the deserts and uh, the Sam Bushman when I was there or the, you know, these different places. And I, say, and I used to say a little bit kind of cocky and say, oh, yeah, yeah, really? Let me bring him to Ontario, northern Ontario on June 15th. Let me see how they take black fly season. We'll see how, how tough they are, you know, because I'll put black flies in, in northern Ontario and Quebec in the middle of June up against any swarming, biting fly anywhere, anytime for my money. So that's it. By the way, that's another place where it's really tough, where the bugs are bad, which surprisingly uh, I did not find in the Amazon jungle. There were patches here and there, but I was more scared, I shall say, nervous of just the big, you know, biting, stinging, bullet ants, big wasps, you know, I was nervous for those, but I didn't have any issues with the uh, same swarms of mosquitoes. Ontario, May, May 30th, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to deal with something there. Yeah, I like that. That's kind of like your home ice advantage to use a, a hockey yeah. metaphor. When you're in Canada, you know, all the flora and fauna just like intimately. So you have that advantage. Um, on the other hand, though, and I think, you know, all these questions I'm asking you, they relate back to your book, because this is the great thing about books that I think kids are going to love, is you, know, you often reference these adventures you've had abroad, and then you're giving tips in the book, so kids can learn stuff along the way. And it's certainly true, as you say, that, you know, the flora and fauna is different all over the place. Um, but on the other hand, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about some of the skills you found transferable. So no matter where you were in the world, it was the same skill, like something you learned in a Gotham Park. Maybe it would be applicable to the Amazon or the Cook Islands or wherever, like fire making or shelter making. So maybe uh, to what extent were your skills that you learned here in Canada uh, useful when you were somewhere else? Well, within specifics, often none. But within the principles, almost everything. So it's more going to be the principles of fire making. Uh, 
or the principles of uh, catching a fish or the principles of trapping game or the principles of building a shelter that matter a lot, that, that when you learn those basic principles, those travel with you around the globe. Uh, but the actual specific uh, specifics of it, of course, drastically change because your, your ecosystem is radically different. Um, you know, it's very difficult to make a waterproof roof in Ontario in a predominantly spruce forest. There's a lot of spruce boughs to make your roof waterproof. You know, you want to, if there's no birch bark anywhere, you know, there's no... Uh, poplar bark you can peel off, nothing like that. It's just spruce and black spruce forest or something like that. That's tough. Down in the jungle, waterproof roof, give me three minutes, I'll have one. Leaf, 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 leaf. Okay, we're good now, right? So, so what, what you need to understand when you're, when you're traveling the globe and you're transferring your skills is the principles that you can carry with you. So the principles, for example, here's one, sleeping on the ground will always suck the heat right out of you, even if you're in Papua New Guinea. Uh, sure, a lot more if you're sleeping on the snow in Canada, but the principle is the same. You shouldn't sleep directly on the ground. You need a bed of some sort, even in a jungle. And of course, in the jungle, you want to be up and away from the bullet ants anyway, and the spiders and the snakes and everything else. So uh, that would travel around. Another skill that uh, um, does not travel around the globe, and very few of the principles even, are knowing edible wild plants. You just can't know. You can't go down to Ecuador and know what to eat, know which leaf you can touch, pick, chew on. You can't know. You have to go and learn and train and be taught by somebody. One of the principles there may be in a desperate situation, the principle of how to test if a plant is poisonous. Sure, you can do that anywhere in the world. But that's why with Survivor Man, so, so much of my stuff because was about training before I went. Because remember, with Survivor Man, uh, my goal was to was to teach. I was just being a closet teacher, teaching these skills on camera. That's all I was doing. So going ahead of time and learning all of the wild plants in Costa Rica meant that later I could regurgitate them, if you will, uh, on camera. Uh, be, uh, and I could incorporate the wild plant gathering skill set, the principles of plant gathering wild plants, or the principles of even propagating the way to look at it it's if you know how to build a shelter in one country uh you know the principles of how to build a shelter in another country it's but, but what materials do you use you don't want to spend a day grabbing a leaf that's that's uh going to be very toxic to your skin but it doesn't kick in for six hours and you don't know that and you're like making your bed out of those leaves you don't want to be doing that so you have to learn you know which plants you can use for example uh fire starting well you can do a fire bow anywhere can you show me uh, uh it can be very tricky and, and, and you know, uh, I can do a fire bow in Arizona and I can do a fire bow in Ontario. Okay, long ways apart, fair enough. But fire bows just the same, are spe they're a specific way of making a fire and they work with specific woods. Uh, the principles, for my instruction, it's softwood on softwood. Other people say, no, I like using a birch spindle like the hardwood. Okay, fine, difference of opinion only. So I think that's it. I, th I think that uh, the principles and the various skill sets travel around the world quite well, but the individual nuances, the specifics, no, uh, you have to learn those on location. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point, especially with the, the different types of wood for making fire. That's something I've, uh, I've experimented with using a, a drill press and putting different spindles in and just seeing how well uh, instead of wearing myself out. So that's very true. All right, I think we're going to get to our audience questions in just a second. I want to ask one more fun question, though. Uh, at the back of your book, in your acknowledgments, I was kind of surprised by some of the people uh, you acknowledge. Um, some people who are not as surprised, like Ray Owl, but you mentioned Clint Eastwood and uh, Martin Scorsese, which made me think I've got to ask less uh, on the fictional side of things, because you mentioned you're thinking about writing fiction. So let's talk a little bit about fiction, because, I mean, I think a lot of people, their first spark where they get into survival in the wilderness is probably a Hollywood movie, all right? And there are dozens of Hollywood movies about survival. I'm thinking of movies like The Edge with Anthony Hopkins and Jeremiah Johnson and a lot of Amazon rainforest survival movies. I don't know if you've seen Jungle uh, with the guy from Harry Potter, all that. So let me ask you as an expert. Is there a Hollywood movie that you're a fan of or that you think is more realistic and maybe one that you've seen and you just were shaking your head all through the theater thinking this is the fakest, least authentic Hollywood survival movie I've ever seen. 
I would answer that question and I'd like to put an add in comment of your, your beginning about who I thanked in the in behind there and picking out Clint Eastwood and Martin Scorsese and I'm sure you can see Margaret Atwood, I adore her. Um, Frank Zappa, <laughs> Bruce Coburn, a uh, friend of mine who I've worked with. Uh, that was a shameless name drop for all us Canadians out there. Uh, believe me, it was an honor. Uh, yes, on the movies. It basically goes like this. The best ever, Jeremiah Johnson, hands down. You know, and Jeremiah Johnson, the, the consultant on that was Larry Dean Olson. And I've met and spoken with Larry Dean Olson. Uh, he's, passed, he's passed on now. His protege was David Halliday. David Halliday was the consultant for Castaway and also on some Survivor Man episodes. Now, the Jeremiah Johnson movie, and everybody who likes the outdoors, please watch Jeremiah Johnson with Robert Redford. It is just the best. Uh, I watch it religiously probably twice a year, usually in the wintertime. I'll, you know, maybe a glass of wine. Uh, or a cup of hot chocolate, if you will, and snuggled in and I watched Jeremiah Johnson on a February night kind of thing. It's, it's a powerful, beautiful movie and they get everything right, everything right. The Revenant gets everything wrong, totally wrong. The movie is beautiful, don't get me wrong, I like the movie. I know the Hugh Glass story very, very well. They, they played around with it, fine, that's no problem. Uh, but where, I'm, uh, where I, my criticism lies is in the uh, survival techniques. That's just like, no, that was all, I mean, they, they, those, those producers were watching too much Bear Grylls because man, it was all sensationalized. Just not like, I mean, t case in point, um, the, um, he built a shelter and you're seeing the shelter and then and they pan back and you see this scene and there's a shelter and it's the middle of this, this field and the wind is, or, or snow blown, you know, the snow is blowing and everything. They pan back and the forest is all around. Well, every survival instructor worth his or her own salt knows you would never ever build a shelter in the middle of that wind blown area with the forest right over there. You know, would you do go over there, get the trees, come back out into the wind? I mean, it's just silly. So the Revenant, I'm sorry, they, um, they, uh, I'll just, I better be kind about this. They, they, they made a mess of things. They definitely did it wrong. So Jeremiah Johnson, best ever. Revenant, like so many others, ouch. It's just, as a, but you know what this is though, Adam? It's like, um, if you're a doctor, you can't watch Grey's Anatomy. If you're a lawyer, you can't watch some lawyer legal show, you know. Uh, it, it's, we, we have, in our professions, in our vocations, we just, you try to watch Hollywood versions of us and you're like oh and so me when it comes to survival whether it's what you know whether it's uh naked and afraid or alone or or the revenant uh I, yeah i'm just yeah i'm just like i'm i'm yelling at the tv screen now i don't i don't even have a television at home even though i make tv uh but i'll see them in a hotel somewhere when i'm traveling and that's when i'll watch something like that and i'm just like no anyway there you go I'm relieved that you said The Revenant, because if somebody had asked me, I would have said The Revenant was also the least authentic survival movie I'd ever seen. And I remember when it came out, it was really hyped up as the most authentic wilderness survival movie ever made. So I watched it having high expectations, and I couldn't yeah. believe how many things were wrong with it. And I was astonished. I actually pulled some of my friends that what I thought about it, and they were all crestfallen and disappointed because they said, oh, it's so authentic. But I, I remember like the ecology was all messed up in that movie where you could tell they, they filmed this in totally different environments, but it's cutting scenes. Like they would be on the east coast of the Rocky Mountains in an arid environment. And then the very next scene, like three seconds later, you could tell it was Pacific Northwest rainforest. So it made no sense. And I just remember how like they tried to portray them as being really tough in Montreux in that they would constantly just casually like walk into water in the in freezing cold sub-zero temperatures. And I was like, nobody in the 1800s would be so cavalier about getting wet like that. That's like a death wish. So no, I was actually I, really glad to hear you say that. Oh, you're, you're <laughs> right on the money, Adam. Yeah, and I, I had the same thing. People, again, people would be so crestfallen when I would, I would, I would say, no, the revenant's horrible. They'd, no, you're just being critical. No, I'm telling you, it's really, really bad. Uh, but they did get one thing right. That is probably the best cinematic expression, if you will, of a, of a grizzly bear attack that I think I've ever seen. I thought, you know, I don't know how you'd film something like that and make it look real, but man, that they did a good job. I thought, if I had to imagine a grizzly bear attack, I mean, he picked him up by his back with his teeth. Like, yeah, that's probably, so I felt actually, even though we'll never, we could never really prove that one out, I did feel that they got the grizzly bear attack scene pretty gruesomely good just everything else was wrong yeah just how the bear was sort of on top of them like that and pushing them down into the ground that part makes sense 
Okay, so we're, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I don't know if Steph's going to jump back in here, but we're, we're going to definitely take some of these questions. And, and if you're watching, you have questions for less, by all means, type them into the side there. and We're going to get to some of them. Okay, so I'm not going to look at the chat. Adam, I'll leave this to you to, uh, to, to deliver the question to me. Is that correct? Yeah, unless Steph is going to jump back in here and take them. Otherwise, I can do it. Some of these are a little long, but uh, let's see. Steph went to get a cup of tea. Yeah. Oh, take it away. Okay, you want me to do it. All right, some of these are pretty long. But let, me, uh, let me scan through here. Um, okay, so there's a lot of variations on this question, no. and I'm sure you get it a lot. But uh, for a lot of people, this is a really important question, and it's in your book. Uh, Jacob asked, what are your top three gear items you bring when you're on a trip? If you could bring a fourth and it did, didn't weigh anything or add size to your pack, what would it be? Interesting. Well, I could cop out. Was it, was his name was Jason? Is that correct? Uh, Jacob. Jacob. So Jacob, I could cop out and just say, well, it depends. What are the variables? Where am I going? How long am I going for? Am I alone? What's my mode of travel? So you see... The reality is that uh, there is no um, good for everything survival kit. And I'm going to back up a bit because obviously survival is a, 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 you know, one of my favorite subject matters. Um, here, I'll say this right out. Never, ever buy an off-the-shelf survival kit. In the same way, never, ever buy an off-the-shelf first aid kit. Now, you can get away with more, more with it with the first aid kits because they've, they've had years to, to perfect those. Here's why. First of all, you run the risk of when you buy something like, something like that, you never open it. You never even look inside. You get home and say, oh, I, I, I got my kit and I'll throw it in the pack. So you don't, a lot of times you might not even know what's in there uh, or how to use what's in there. And then when you do, because they've had to lessen the price so much to make it an all-in-one kit, the items are cheap. They break. Now you have to look at what these kits are all for. And I'm getting to your question, Jacob, but think about what, what you're asking me and what these items are for. Well, in a survival kit, for example, it's to save your life. In a first aid kit, kind of roughly the same thing. Do you want to bet your life on some cheap items that somebody threw together in a kit and made it all bright orange or put a camo, camouflage pattern on it because that's a big thing on TV these days? No. -uh. What you want to do is you want to design your own items that go in these things. And of course, take a proper course how to do these things before you go out whether it's to yourself or somebody else so you find and get your own items now to get that's a big thing for me by the way which is why you'll never see even though i did for a while put together a survivor man kit it was so expensive i don't know that we ever sold any i i actually still have a hundred in my office i give them away to friends because they're expensive why are they expensive because i would not let them bring in cheap items these are survival items they're meant to keep you alive in a last ditch situation there it's really kind of meant to never be opened hopefully ever but when you do have to open your kit that you made yourself you know what's in there is quality that's why i say don't put a don't get a kit with a knife in it why not you gotta have a knife yes but you should have a good quality knife that you picked up separately and you, and, and and it's strong and will work in the situation uh so my top four items uh well it's the top three and then the what do I want to throw in extra? Um, the, I would suggest starting with number one. I'll go the other direction this time. Number one, a way to start a fire, uh, plus a way to start a fire, plus a way to start a fire. Uh, I, you know, no matter where you are, and Adam, I know you'll attest to this too. Wherever you are, fire make, a fire at night makes everything better, even in the middle of the jungle where it's hot. You know, a desert where it's hot. It's cold at night. A fire for me has been my best friend on every single single survival situation. So the number one thing is a great way to get a fire going. Oh, good. What should it be? Should it be like one of those flint sticks or ferro rods? And a, no, I want a really powerful butane lighter with fuel. I, I, I don't want to mess around. I don't want to rub two sticks together if I have to survive. No, -uh, that's a last ditch painful way to get a fire going. People come to my cabin with me or my cottage and they're so, they're so heartbroken when they see me pull out fire starter and stuff and light my fire. I was like, what do you want me to do? Rub two sticks together? Uh, that's for survival. No, -uh. so, so you want a really great way to get a fire going, whichever way you like best. I really like those sort of torch type lighters that are really powerful in the wind. But you got to have fuel, of course, to go with that. Uh, number two uh, would be probably a way to boil water. 
So a proper pot that you can boil water in. and being able to purify water and drink water or melt snow. I mean, face it, water's next. Water or not next, but water's one of the top things on your list of what you need to survive. You can go a long time without food, but, but water, that's tricky. Uh, three days, right? Three to five days and you're in big trouble, big, big trouble. You might last seven days. Sure. Some people even last to 10 days, but you're not in any condition and many people die after three. So uh, we've got our fire starting, got a way to, bo way to boil water. Uh, maybe number two actually should have been though, a shelter. Shelter is the toughest thing. Again, whenever someone's been on a survival situation and they've come in, they've, they've made it. They, they, not one of those people ever said, you know, I wish I could have been lost out there longer because I really wanted to work on my A-frame shelter. It's like, no, they just wanted to go home. When you're stuck in a survival situation, the only thing you want to do is go home and be with your family again. Nobody wants to be out in survival. So all of the stuff that's happened on TV in the last bunch of years, making it look like recreation, that's, that's not the deal. So we got fire, we've got a shelter, we've got water. The fourth item I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, it will depend on a variable. Uh, so for me, that fourth item, if it's bug season, is a bug jacket. That's my fourth fun item that weighs almost nothing and is a lifesaver. You wanna try sleeping the black flies, or you got the black flies during the day and the mosquitoes at night in June in Ontario. So that fourth favorite item, and that's one people don't think about putting in their survival kits. Like, yeah, like, like if you, maybe you have a bug jacket, maybe you don't at all, you don't even like them. Well, but in your survival kit, if you're gonna be in that place at that time, at least have a, a head bug net that folds down to almost nothing and goes in there because wow, wow, bugs, you know? So I think that's, uh, and I didn't, you notice I didn't even mention food because that's further down, further down the line. So hopefully that answers your question, Jacob. Got a little long-winded there. I think that, I think that definitely answered the question. And this is one of the things you address directly in your book. You have in a detailed itinerary. I also like the, in your book, you even specified a high quality knife. It has to be a high quality knife. Um, we have another question here from Kristen. Uh, she asks, uh, she says, hi Les, I was wondering if you could share your most terrifying animal encounter since your amazing moose story you shared years ago. So obviously, oh, so, so not the moose story, but not the moose story. This is someone who knows the moose story. I think a lot of us are familiar with the moose story. Um, but yeah, other than the moose story or since the moose story. Yeah. And you know what? I should, I should have mentioned, by the way, um, and I want to go right to page 19 here because it's my favorite page in the book, but massive props to Andrew P. Barr and to Laura Bombier, that is the illustrator and the photographer, because with these stories, for example, there is Andrew's amazing illustration. But because of all my adventures, because I was you know, off, often filming and we would go and, and take photographs and stuff, usually after, after the fact, especially on the ones where I was supposed to be alone because Shark Week, I wasn't alone and Bigfoot, I wasn't alone and Beyond Survival, I wasn't alone, but Survivor Man, I was alone. Then we have the photograph, look at that. So there's the illustration and there's the actual photograph obviously i'd taken my jacket off at that point but there the, all that happened and so this has been a wonderful thing is to see my own adventures being relived through these illustrations and photographs uh and now sorry what was your question again <laughs> what was Kristen the question? was wondering uh and i think the kids are gonna, really going to love the illustrations in the book it brings it alive uh but i Kristen was asking uh she was wondering uh if you could share your most terrifying oh. animal encounter other than the moose story the amazing Bye. moose story and I'll say that the, uh, it's uh, that second story, although I talk about bumping into a lynx, I talk about being chased by a jaguar, but the second story, I was in India. It was one of the last episodes of Survivor Man I actually, uh, ever, ever filmed. I was in the territory of a tigress with cubs. And before I went in, the park superintendent said, well, uh, you know, you're gonna need to be incredibly careful here because there is a tigress in, living in the area where, right where you're going to be. She has a number of cubs and she's killed 21 people this year. And then she goes, but she's only eaten the last 12. <laughs> and so I was in this area with a Bengal tiger in Jim Corbett Park in, in India. And I did at one point hear this guttural growl sound. The peacocks were there all the time. There's elephants. Elephants were even more dangerous in many ways. But big cats, I, I'm nervous of them. It's funny that, that uh, you know, ironically, my, one of my favorite stories is bumping into a Canadian lynx, and it was a beautiful encounter. It's, and that's in the book. 
but the tiger in India, uh, I ended up having to climb a tree, which honestly was, you know, probably a fool's game because I was up in the tree thinking, well, at least I'm up in the tree. I mean, the tiger, you know, it could have actually stood on its back legs and reached me. It was only about 12 feet in the air and they can reach to 10 feet uh, and, or jump. And that night sitting in that tree, unable to sleep because you're in a tree, hearing a, a, a tiger, Bengal tiger down below, hearing the monkeys, you know, 200 yards over there, the monkeys start going crazy. You know, the tiger's there. An hour later, they're going crazy over there. Now you know the tiger's over there. That was really scary for me. Uh, in that particular episode, and I, I do these director's commentaries on my YouTube channel where I play the episode and then I talk all about it. I interrupt it and say, here's what happened. And one of the stories from that uh, particular one was that uh, they wouldn't let me do this unless I had arm chaperones. Oh, well, then you were fine. You had arm chaperones. Yeah, except I never saw them. And usually they were quarter kilometer away. Well, okay. I was like, what good were they going to do me if a tiger had attacked me? Were they going to come running? Like, like, so, and I, they, I barely saw them the whole week and they, I don't know how often they saw me. Maybe they were spying on me, which would be fine. Uh, but that night I had to spend the night in the tree because of a Bengal tiger. And if you watch that episode, you can see the uneasiness in my face. That was probably one of the most, and I was in lion territory in South, Af in, in South Africa, but that was the most nervous I was ever. Yeah, that's a very intense moment for sure. Uh, we have another question here. This is on the storyteller side of things uh, from Kevin. It's a long one, but it's been condensed for us. So uh, this is the question from Kevin. How do you position yourself as a storyteller of your own experience before an audience to whom extreme encounters in the wild rarely ever occur? And what kind of storytelling devices do you return to? Absolutely. Great, great question. Because that's what this whole book is about. That's what my whole existence and life has been about. Uh, Survivor Man, for example, um, is about exactly that. How many people go and survive in the Amazon jungle? Almost nobody. Uh, you know, um, or do even, Adam, what you've done? Almost nobody. And you, you know what? And so I've never gotten this question before, and I like it a lot. So in a roundabout way, let's say, let's paint a picture here. Let's say I'm at a, at a, a party. Remember those? Uh, let's say I'm at a party and uh, talking with people. And Mr. World Adventure is going to talk about the Jaguar. Oh, that, you know, so you, you have to be really sensitive uh, about how you tell these stories. Uh, but most importantly, my goal is to get them to relate. And what you really do there, and I'm not saying I'm a humble individual, probably the opposite. So you have to be so self-aware about the privilege you'd ha you've had of being an adventurer, of doing adventures. Take that self-awareness and, and remember, who you're, remember who you're speaking to. In the case of Survivor Man, if I ever got too highfalutin about what I was doing as an adventure where I was, I would remember, wait a minute, Les, you're about to do this fire bow in Alaska or whatever, which was a fire plunge in Alaska. Just teach a 10 year old boy or girl. Just look into the camera at one 10 year old boy or girl. Tell them. And so this is what I would do, I would just you hear that about entertainers all the time. Oh, I imagine only one person in the audience. Yeah. Well, I did that, you know. And remember, for me, in my case, because I was filming myself, all I had to look at was a was a, a black hole. That's what I looked at for seven days was a black hole. Couldn't even see myself except for the flip out screen. And that can be distracting. So sometimes I wouldn't put it there. So now I'm talking to a black hole. But no, I would be talking to a 10-year-old boy or girl and tell them the story. So I think you have to humble yourself. You have to remind yourself to be humble because let's face it, if you're already a storyteller, you probably have a healthy ego. I probably have a healthy, I'll put it say that way. I probably have a healthy ego. That's the performer in me. And, and you know, I will say that often, you know, uh, with my wife who might start to tell a story. And I got this from this movie called uh, Big Fish. Like, well, yeah, it tells all of the facts and none of the flavor. And so me, I'm a lot of flavor with the facts coming in there. And 
The flavor is the fun part. The facts is the education, but the humility is bringing yourself down to this place, not down to, not down, maybe, maybe raising yourself up to the proper place to be with humility that these people don't have the opportunity to get out there. How, how can I make them relate to this? How can I get them excited about it? With Survivor Man, I constantly said, I am not the survival guru. Um, you know what I'm doing right now? Let me show, I'll case in point. So I am doing my Wild Harvest show. Uh, it, it's a television series. It's on the YouTube thing. Wild Harvest, local foraging, right? I know a lot of wild plants. So I could be sharing this experience to people and being all like, I'm just going to rip off a bunch of facts about the uh, juniper bush here that we're doing, which we're going to do tomorrow on the show, or the fireweed. And I will look like, you know, the, the, the king of wild edible plants. You know what I do instead? We make sure we get scenes of me reading these to remind people just one of them. And I think I'll end it that way by saying you, you, you enable yourself to, to pull whatever humility you have to, to, to just be one of them. And anybody who wants to go out and, and discover wild edible plants right now is probably going out with a book like this. And so am I. Uh, and same thing with survival. Um, I hope, hopefully, Adam, I, I answered the question okay there, but uh, if I was sensing where, where he was going, but um, I, think, I think that's the way I do it. I don't want to put out a false sense of modesty or anything like that, but yeah, I would remind myself, get, get over yourself, Les. You've got, you've got to teach something here, get teaching. Yeah, I think you absolutely answered the question. We have time for just one final question, which is a shame because uh, there were a lot I, of other questions. Is fun. We can't get, we can't I've get got, to the I've got, I've got friends actually right now who are out, out, out doing... I'm waiting to go out onto a lake right now, but this is fun. So yeah, I'm, no hurry on my part, but go ahead. Okay, well, this is another thought-provoking question here. This is from Dane Erickson. And Dane asks, how do you see your role as a wilderness educator impacting the greater issue of getting people outside, conservation of the natural world, and mental health? Good question. Wow, you guys ask tough questions. <laughs> I don't know. I struggle every day. I thought we were talking about it today. Where is my role? How strong should that role be? Should I be fighting hard to get dolphins out of tanks and orcas out of tanks? Should I be fighting hard to get plastic off of ocean beaches? Should I be talking about climate change? Should I be, uh, should I be fighting for one particular area? Uh, I would say that I'll answer this way. In our various roles in life, we can either be selfish for a time, we can be community oriented or globally oriented. I discovered that I'm best when I'm globally oriented. So I write music and I write books and I do films that go out across the globe and that sort of thing. I like that, you know, selfish is important. You need to be selfish sometimes to do, go to school, university, to train for fitness, to learn a new skill. I think it's selfish time, but then what are you doing with it? And so I do ask myself this question all the time. I'm copying out of way. I'm not even going to have an answer for you. You know why? I don't know. I constantly challenge myself. I would, I would put that question back to Adam. It's like, you know, what are our roles here? Now, some people know right away. I want to save this bay. Well, that's a very community, bay, you know, focused thing. I, I just, we just filmed an episode on the Pitt River outside of Vancouver, which should all be a protected area. And it's not, but I don't live there. And I, I have full on, you know, empathy with my friends there, but I don't live there. So I'll do some tweets for them and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm not dedicated. So my role is not to save the Pitt, Pitt River area, Valley. Um, so I see my role more globally. Uh, I will answer, here's my final answer to this question. It's this way. I, we, I, I feel weak on taking a stance on something publicly and presenting materials or more than anything, dedicating my life to one subject matter, except for this. I realized that what I do best is connect people to nature. My passion for nature uh, and my ego has me as a performing dude means that I can perform, if you will, storytell, if you will. And that maybe, maybe that will just, if I can get just one person, you know, if I can get a young Adam Schultz just to go outside and learn to paddle a canoe, I've done my job. And I, I've achieved my, my role, if you will. So I think that's where I see my role and will probably continue. Maybe I'll get older and I'll get more like upset about something here and there. I, I'm upset about a lot of things, but in the end, I think I'm most effective uh, just 
with my enthusiasm for the, for the natural world and just trying to convince people, yes, yes, get outside. You know, and you parents, you, uh, you parents, it doesn't have to be you. If you don't even like nature, oh, you guys are going to love this. I was sitting in a restaurant the other day and, and, a, and a woman was talking about bear summer. She goes, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's just too much nature. And I'm just like, oh, oh my heart was just breaking. And um, so I say, with parents, you're not into it. Okay, but there are other people like Adam Schultz and educators and me who love nature. Let your kids turn to them because those of us who love nature are passionate about it. We don't make any money at it, so we're passionate about it. So, uh, you know, I give, I think it's about, my role is to, to, again, give license to people to know that it's okay to be a nature nut. Absolutely, and I think that's a great way to wrap up the questions. I wish we had time for more, but your publisher is telling us that uh, we're out of time. And uh, I hope everyone is going to get a copy of the book today. I know Steph's going to come back in and give you guys instructions on that. But thank you on behalf of our whole audience, Les, for taking our questions. And uh, absolutely fascinating talking to you. And good luck out in the Rockies there uh, with what you're doing next. Adam, thank you so very much. And again, we, I, I am, it's a mutual fanism here because I'm a fan of your work. And uh, when everything is safe and good and all right to do so, I'll see you in Toronto for a cup of coffee. Sounds good. Uh, Steph, all yours. All right, great. Thanks so much, Les and Adam, for what a, a very engaging, interesting, fun conversation. Lots of uh, laughs and really great storytelling there. Um, but uh, again, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And it's great to see so many people showing up and, and uh, participating in these events with us. Uh, if you are interested in purchasing Wild Outside, we do have a limited number of uh, signed copies and we'll have uh, more copies beyond that for um, anyone who's interested in picking up a copy for themselves or for a young person in their life. So uh, please, if you'd like to visit our website at bookshelf.ca or give us a call or stop by our store, uh, you can seek us out and we are be happy to help you out in getting a copy of uh, Wild Outside. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. And Steph, I'll see you in Guelph.